And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Reconciled invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Welcome to the Out of Exit podcast. I'm here with Kevin McArdle, who is the CEO of Big Band Software, and we're going to talk about mergers and acquisitions today. Thank you for being on the show, Kevin. No, it's a pleasure to be here, Ronald. Thanks for having me. Cool. I always like to start with the origin story. The year-long joke, or last, I guess, year-and-a-half-long joke now is, hey, you were born, and then now you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisition. Can you give me the, fill in the gap between? Bill. Yeah, fill in the gaps there. Yeah, I like that. I'll maybe skip the school part, but then my professional career has been a winding path, which I'm happy with where I ended up. But I like sharing that because especially young people think that it's supposed to be a straight line, and rarely is that how most careers end up. So. I went to school at college thinking I wanted to be a high school math teacher for the rest of my life. So I was a math and secondary ed major. And I was a high school math teacher right out of college and realized I just didn't love it. And I needed to try something else before I kind of got stuck in that career. And so I sort of fell backwards into a software company called Cerner, which is based in Kansas City where I grew up. And it's an electronic medical record company. It's giant. It was recently acquired by Oracle. When I joined, it was 3,000 people doing 300 million of revenue, which is a great big company, but Mm -hmm. got acquired for tens of billions, I believe. And so I was there for 15 years and got to see how great software companies were run from the inside. I learned sales operations. I managed dev teams manage big client relationships, got to do just about every job that didn't involve writing code. And then had the opportunity to step out of that and start acquiring businesses. I had some smaller financial backers and I wanted to try something different. And so did that and that was successful. I acquired 45 businesses in seven years, provided good return to investors and then realized along the way that there was a bigger, better way to do things. So while acquiring and, you know, operating these businesses, I was also trying to study the M&A world. Wish your podcast would have existed back then, but I listened to other, you know, experts in the field and just got to thinking about what fit my personality and what I thought worked and what doesn't really not work. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. For example, most private equity, you raise a fund, you hold those assets for a little while, you would try to improve them. And then you've got to pay off the fund, meaning you have to sell your best assets. And I know you're a real estate guy, among other things, Ronald. So if you've got a great asset that's performing well, that's not the one you want to sell, right? You want to sell off the stuff that's not performing well. The timing of funds and always having to be ready to flip a business. It's great. It worked for some people. It just didn't fit my personality. I studied folks like Constellation Software and Roper Technologies and Berkshire Hathaway. And these groups just aggregate great businesses and they hold on to them for as long as possible. And so with big band software, that's how we're structured. It's not a fund. It's a SaaS holding company. We only acquire B2B SaaS businesses. And myself, my team, our investors are all aligned around build a great portfolio with no expectation we ever have to sell a business. So that's what we're building now at Big Band. That's a huge win. I actually know of a couple. I had a guest on here on the show in my line doing media asset 
And within a week, he sent me a, he sent not just me, he, sent, he blasted everybody he knew, I guess, with the exit he needed to do. And I'm like, why would you sell this thing? It's very profitable. Mm -hmm. He's selling it at the peak too. I'm looking for things I can improve, but you know, so it was out of my bailiwick uh, as far as what I was looking for, but it was a great asset. And I'm thinking, why would he do that? And then I realized he's PE backed and he's owned Gotta that. Pay back those investors. Yeah. He's owned that for yeah. three and a half years. It's time. He probably has a four year or five year or three year to five year timeline with these guys and yeah. they expect liquidity. I don't want to do that. So that's why I call mine a holding company is I don't have intentions. I'll probably sell some of them, but uh, my intentions is to take these, grow these, keep these. And if I exit, yeah. I'll exit the whole package at some point in the future. I'm 51 now, so maybe 10 years from now, I'll get bored with this, right? But yeah, even if in a portfolio level, I like to say buy and hold is our business strategy. Mm -hmm. It is not our religion. Mm -hmm. If it's the right thing for a particular business to sell it, mm -hmm. I want to do that because I want to, not because yes. I have to, because of fund timing right. where I have to pay my investors back. For example, we buy a business for $10 million. And after a couple of years, we've got it marked at, we think it's worth 20 million, but somebody's willing to pay me 40. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. We're going to have that conversation. And I'm I may be happy to part with that business for 40 million because yeah. it, they think it's worth more than I do. But the point is that you make the right decision for each portfolio company at the right time. You don't just liquidate everything because you have to pay investors. That's what I wanted to build. I did the same thing inside of the real estate. I had a piece of real estate. Somebody called me up, so they wanted it. Like, that's not for sale. And then they, when they offered me something, I was like, yeah, it's for sale. Right. It was the location. Yeah. It was a perfect location. They had just legalized something in Oklahoma. And this was like right, right in the area where it would be a great, it was acreage too. It had a few acres on it and they could mm. put greenhouses on it and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. They're willing to pay way over market rate for it. And I was like, okay, sold. Yeah, right. there you go. It's a great example of what I'm talking about. You yeah. just make the decision based on the business, not because you have to sell it like your friend that you were talking about. Yeah. And it's the same thing goes with these, if your business, to some people, something you hold might be a strategic advantage for them to have, and they're going to pay you a premium over it. You think it's worth 20 and they're willing to pay 40 because strategically it adds 45, 50 to their bottom line. So why big band software? Why that name? To me, it's big band software. Big band sounds like fun. And, I, and by looking at your website, that's kind of the vibe I get. Like, hey, you're going to try to take something. To, that I get the vibe. Maybe I'm wrong that you can take something that looks mundane and drag out and a little painful for some from people and put a little life into it. So yeah, that's part of the theory. And yeah, I appreciate you saying it looks fun. It, it is. So when I had the chance to take out a clean sheet of paper and map out what I wanted big band to be. There were requirements of the investors I wanted to work with and their time horizon, size of check, number of investors. There were individual people that I knew I wanted to work with. And then there were just sort of like cultural things that I wanted to be a part of the company. And I built my career on treating people the right way and mm -hmm. not taking advantage of folks and things like that. Things that unfortunately are quite common in the m a world, the private equity world, however you want to describe it. And one of the things I wrote down is I want it to be fun. And so when we were working on the brand and I had all this with no, without the name and mm. you know, I have two partners in the business, Chris and Jason, that are on the website, if anybody wants to look at their backgrounds, but we just started thinking about what do we want to call this? And I had a couple of rules. We're not going to name it after a body of water, like every other private equity firm does. We're not going to name it anything related to space because Constellation is the biggest example of what we're trying to do. And I don't want to look like a follower. Mm -hmm. It can't be anybody's street that they grew up on because that's a cliche also. So we had a lot of things that we didn't want to do because at a basic level, we wanted to stand out and be different from what the uh, most of the, but we are a software holding company. I don't like calling us a private equity firm because we were not, we do most everything different than P, but at its core, we are using private money to acquire private businesses. So technically that's what we are. And so with the brand and the name, we wanted to in many ways, look the opposite of those firms. And all those firms have boring websites that are all blue and green and doesn't look that fun. You know, it looks like they got a lot of smart people who know how to write graphs that go up and to the right, but that's just not what we wanted to be about. And we started uh, went around musical names because it's fun and a couple of us are musicians, they're not very good. And but just clicked and was easy for us. And I know you, you mentioned off camera that we were, you were into flipping websites back in the day and mm -hmm. a lot of great names are taken and, but big band, I was shocked to find out like it, it, it wasn't, it was there and we loved it as we kept working on it and thinking about it. A big band is a bunch of musicians that are specialists in one thing or another coming together to make a sound that 
no one of them could create on their own. And that's kind of a description of a great company in a lot of ways too. And no matter what type of music people like, almost everybody I know loves some type of music. That music feel, that vibe just kind of makes people smile. And in a perfect world, that's what our business will do too. Yeah, yeah. One of the things was, was I, I used to be a domainer. One of the guys I interviewed this last week, his CEO is the founded CEDU or SEDO. I don't know how do you pronounce it, which was a basically a parking site and a domain trading oh. site. Uh, it sold years ago. But I actually had a, a friend slash performance coach. We were chatting and we were talking about what I was going to name the holding company. And he's like, just do what everybody else does. Pick your favorite color and the tree in your front yard. So it came this close to my uh, holding company to be called Blue Sequoia because I'm in the Redwood Forest. Yeah. But it was Blue Sequoia was actually taken, by the way. So I was like, no. it was just one of those. So I chose something else. I chose a mythical creature that uh, it brings in wealth. It's called a Payuksu. It's a dragon looking lion that, that uh, I think it's in Chinese or Japanese culture they put in front of. In the feng shui, but it's media holding. But, you know, it's still thing. It's cliche, right? It's just one of those. It wasn't taken. It was kind of symbolic of some sense. And it wasn't blue sequoia because after I thought about it deeply, I was like, yeah, that's, like, that's how a lot of these, your favorite color and a favorite thing, yeah. you know, are being. Well, at the end of the day, a name is a name, but like a website, a brand, a culture, mm -hmm. a vibe, that's what people remember. Yeah. And all that takes a lot of work and it doesn't matter what name you pick. The hard work is making it mean something to you and your team and the rest of the world. So um, let's take this show. I, I started this show because I was you know, looking at maybe becoming a broker when I came out of the real estate space, becoming a business broker. And then decided I just, the, <laughs> the, the barrier to entry was so low. A buddy of mine bought a brokerage and said, hey, I'll just make yourself a business card and call you a broker. And I was like, don't I have to take some license? This is Oklahoma. Some states have licensing, like Oklahoma has no licensing or anything. And I thought, oh man, that means that all the other guys in town have may or may not have the the credentials that have mm -hmm. bought and sold things or anything. So let's talk about your investment thesis. I'm kind of curious. Out of the 45 or 50 uh, companies you and your team have bought in the past, was there a theme? Were they all software based? Were they roofing companies or heat and air? And now you're in software. I mean, I'm, I'm no, curious. I'll all tech because that was my background. And then pretty quickly, I started to focus on B2B SaaS. But in SaaS, software as a service for those of your listeners who are in more of the plumbing and heating and air stuff, because that was my background. After being in tech for 15 years, that's what I understood and knew the economics of it, knew how to run a good software company. And my partners both also worked in technology and software. And so our focus, to answer your question, we're buying business to business software companies for one to 10 million in annual revenue, we want them to be profitable and we want them to be growing. And beyond that, like we're industry agnostic. I'd love to be in a hundred industries in the next five years. And as long as it's uh, B2B profitable growing and in that size range, we're interested. Where are you located and does demographics come into play at all? I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. One of my partners is in St. Paul, same metro area. And then our third partner is in Phoenix and geography doesn't matter. It's just, it's easier to get to a deal that everybody likes if it's U.S. based or certainly North American. We look at deals all over. We're open to an acquisition from anywhere in the world, but if it's a stock sale or asset sale, that sort of impacts what's good for the buyer versus what's good for the seller. But we're, geography doesn't matter. I've worked in a remote context for most of my career, working with teams that are not in the same office as me just comes super naturally. And I'm, I'm more about like, where's the best business opportunity and not looking within a hundred miles of where I happen to live. I always ask because some people are very interested in staying local. And I should, I said demographics when it should have been geography. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll acknowledge my, my slip up there. Yeah. You know. yeah. The, is there any other characteristics of the business? So it's B2B, like there's all kinds of B2B plays. A lot of people think just B2B is a CRM tools and, but there are tools inside of industries. There's, there's actually B2B SaaS companies that collect instrument data from, you know, machine shops and help report when things need to be repaired and track wear and tear. I know mm -hmm. a guy that he sells sensors that go on machines that te detect vibration and can tell the owners when they need to start changing things. Just there's yeah, all kinds we actually, of we looked at a similar company. I can't really talk about details because yeah. uh, we're under NDA, but yeah, like a combination of sensors that measure something and software that translates that to the user. Other characteristics, I would say 
Typically, given, so I mentioned one to 10 million in annual revenue. So we're potentially flying below the radar of the big enterprise software that people are used to seeing. And that's fine. We love niche software. Part of what I like about the holding company model is that we don't have to have a plan for we're going to sell this to Google in five years, or we're going to sell this to Atlassian in five years, which is a massive software company for those that don't know. We're happy to own a niche software business that can just exist on its own and we can grow it and help it be healthy and profitable. And we don't have to look for that exit. And so that allows us to be, I would say, more open to different businesses than other people might. And so it could be the most obscure niche you've ever heard of. And I love using examples of this, but you know, most deals were under, if I you've described the niche too much, it might disclose, but one that I can share that was on an example of something that I hadn't even really considered, even though like once, once you see it, it's there. We looked at a software company years ago. So we're long past the NDA period that was automating the work of longshore men and women at ports, right? So historically, there's somebody tracking what's coming off a ship that's moved from halfway around the world and they're using a clipboard. This software quite simply just turned that clipboard into ones and zeros and digits so that it was automated all kinds of benefits for both the ship, the, uh, the user, the port to just automate the whole process. And it was one of those things that like, I didn't even, i never, I don't know anybody that does that job. It's a job that sure. Now that I know, obviously it exists, but it wasn't something I thought of, but that type of like super niche software, are the types of things that we love. Yeah. I find I discover software tools and stuff. You just never thought people would create or didn't know they existed. I did a, a two-year leadership development program with a guy who was a CEO of a software company that their software, I'm probably going to butcher it if Travis hears me, I don't mean to butcher your business, but they do insurance. They make a connection between like insurance agents and insurance carriers and the underwriters and standardize the forms and stuff. And he's actually, there's no standardized set of forms and stuff. So he's actually lobbying and creating groups and helping create some standards in there, but their software helps make that connection between like when two insurance companies have to co-pay on something or whatever, the forms and stuff and the connection. But once you start looking into it, like most every one of your users uses some type of software, whether it's on their smartphone or on their laptop. But right. once you start digging into it, really understand in a, in my job, our, we look at literally hundreds of deals each month mm. and try to pick the one or two that we are most excited about that we want to work with the seller to like see if we can find a deal. It is near infinite, the amount of software companies that are out there in the world, mm -hmm. uh, because every time where there's two businesses that have trouble talking to each other, that's an opportunity to create software to make it work. Every time there's somebody using a clipboard for anything, software opportunity. Anybody that's still using Excel or Google Sheets in their workflow, that's an opportunity to build a software company. Mm -hmm. And so there are tens of thousands of software companies out there in the world that you or your users may not realize even exist. They may never hear about in their lifetime, but it's a great business because it's helping somebody do their job better, faster, more predictably, more profitably. And therefore it's a business that big band would be excited to acquire. And the other exciting thing about our space is that it is so cheap to start a software company. Uh, gone are the days where you need to r raise venture capital just to get servers in your basement to, to run your company. Amazon and AWS has made that super easy for everybody and Microsoft's got their version, et cetera, but it is close to free to start a software company. So you still need a great idea. You still need grit. You still need hard work. You still need customers who are willing to pay you for that idea. But the barrier to entry is super low from a cost perspective. So. Thousands of new software companies are sprouting up literally every day, which is exciting for people like us. I remember in the early 2000s, I created an online dating site that cost me nearly uh, all my money at that time. No, yeah. Almost. Well, that was not just almost you, that's seven how it figures. Right, yeah. yeah. And mo the, like, I had 27, I think, at the peak programmers, designers, and stuff like that around the world uh, from everywhere from India to stuff. So that was a big chunk of the cash that we spent. But also the big chunk of the cash was the servers. And when my current wife now, when she met me, I had 13 1U servers underneath the bed in my apartment, like running off mm -hmm. of the, like the, it was cheaper to get the, to get 
the internet connection at the house could back then, I don't even know what it is right now, but it was insane for commercial bandwidth, like ban commercial mm -hmm. bandwidth was 15 times what residential bandwidth was costing. So uh, it was cheaper to you know, get a, get the fat pipe going to the house than it was to get one <laughs> going to the office. So I built, I brought all the servers home one day and it went ran faster, <laughs> but it's like the, all the VPN software, all the clustering, all the tools and stuff like that. The, that ate up a lot of the funds too. So I can get that that's all. And then like we did something small a year or two ago and I built it all on uh, AWS on Amazon. And it was like, wow, this, you only pay for what you use, the cycles you turn inside. And it was pretty impressive how cheap it was. So yeah, cheap to get they, started. Now they, they get you at the end, they're going to get paid. But entrepreneurs today at least have that bit a little bit easier. Now, the flip side of that is it's ultra competitive, right? Like right. I follow a lot of people online who point out slash complain that copycats are easy. So we had a little bit of audio issue. We lost you something just a second ago. So. I, I do believe we were, where were we? What were we talking about there? <laughs> we were talking about how like the cost of launching a new business is way less than in the past. The, the flip side of that is that it, it might just be more competitive. So it's easy for people to copy an idea and start a copycat business. So it's not that entrepreneurship itself is easier these days, but the cost to entry, the cost to get started is lower, which I think, I think it's just good. it. And no longer who wealthy. has the best idea, it's who has product market fit first, right? Who has the most money, which I think is wonderful for the world or for entrepreneurship. And yeah, you still have to have a great idea. You have to be, it's more about execution. And so yeah, getting to product great team, do you know how to run a business? Those are the, those are what we're competing with, not who can raise the most money. Okay, cool. So now does that make the pool of things you have to look through? Harder to, I mean, you got more and more to look through, but are there, I guess it's just diamonds in the rough, right? There's part of me that says it would be better, it'd be better if there was a little bit more barrier entry, because then you got fewer qualified candidates to look at. And then on the other side, now you get to like, how do you, the real trick, I guess I'm looking for, and I'm kind of stumbling on how to say it. It's how do you mm -hmm. sort through all that, that haze, right? There's got to be a haze of there's a million software companies out there that are almost on the cusp, but you know, they should be on your radar, but how mm -hmm. do you start filtering through those? I'll tell you a couple of different ways I think about it. If you compare it to owning a car, which is an easy mm -hmm. comparison that people can understand, like in some ways it's, do we really need a hundred to companies? And you, especially if you look outside of the United States where you and I happen to live, yeah. there's hundreds of car companies and each one of those has a dozen models going back. 20 years that are probably still drivable. And it's like this, it's too much choice. But then when you go to a big dealer, you want that choice because you want something that fits perfectly the type of car you need for you and or your family, what your person is, what you like. And so I, I think of that in terms of businesses. Yeah, our job might be easier if there were only 10 companies for me to look at in a given month, but I'd rather have the choice and I'd rather look at two, 300 and be able to narrow it down to what I'm most excited about. And so it does make our job a little bit more difficult, but, and there is a bit of haze and kind of looking for the needle in the haystack, but our criteria is pretty wide open. We're not focused on a specific industry or sector. B2B SaaS is a big universe, as I already described, right. but then, okay, are you profitable? That narrows the universe a great deal. Are you growing? That narrows the universe. Are you between one and $10 million in annual revenue? That narrows the universe. And it's still a big universe, but it allows us to focus and it allows us to be great at evaluating those types of businesses. Mm -hmm. And me and my partners have been doing this for combined three decades. And none of us is that old. I'm saying like, we've all been in the business for a long time. Right. And so we've gotten pretty good at realizing what's a good business that we want to spend some time and energy on, or what's something that maybe isn't good for us right now, but we can follow the seller and say, look, you're not as profitable as we would like to see. And so let's stay in touch. And in six months, let's check in and see what your profitability is there. So again, back to being a holding company, we've got a lot, a lot of forever. We might not buy the business, but we have the luxury of saying, well, hey, check back in six months, check back in a year. And our answer might be different. Cool. So now that we've covered some of that, what about, what is the culture you're looking for? Is there a cultural type of environment in the company? And then once we cover that, are, are there absolutely red flags? Okay, if this is just something I don't want to be. Every business, every industry has cultural type of things that 
that happens. I know the tech industry does. I came from the dot com area, right? Where I worked mm-hmm. at Excite.com when it was in its heyday. And we had slides that went from the first floor to the second floor. And we had a beer trucks that showed up every other Friday. We'd have, you know, keggers outside. And, but what are some of the cultures you're okay with? And what do you, what are you looking for as far as company fit for does culture matter? Does the, like the development oh, yeah. environment matter? Culture matters a great deal to me. And yeah, I'm never worked at a place with a slide. Big fan of beers at work, but actually I think culture is way beyond things like that. It's what, how do we treat each other? What behaviors are acceptable and rewarded and incentivized and what behaviors are not acceptable. And I think the culture that really matters is more important than beer and snacks at the office. I I sort of was brought up career-wise in a work hard, play hard culture. I like to inject into my business. I like to say we take our business very seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. It's important that we do a good job for ourselves and for our investors and for the people that are just enough to sell us their bit. I treat that as a big responsibility to take care of that business and be a good steward of that business. But we're not brain surgeons. If I have a bad day, right. nobody dies. I just, just like to remind myself and anybody else in the tech world, don't get an overinflated view of yourself or what you're doing. And no matter how big business in the tech world, if it goes away, something else will replace it. And so, yeah, cult, a culture is very important to me. And it, it boils down to just how do we treat one another? And I'm a big fan of life work balance. I put it in that order with purpose work. It, yep. not, it should not be as important as whatever we have going on outside of work. And if you kind of start with that premise in mind, it, it tends to put things into perspective. Like how important is it that this thing get done today? There are things that it's important. And there's times where we have to run a hundred miles an hour, but those should be balanced with times that we're not running that fast. Now, when it comes to buying a business, like it's a great thing. If the person we're buying from has that same attitude, because that's going to be a natural fit. Cultures are all different. Even if people kind of say the same things as I just said, you you really work with people to understand what the culture of their business is. And a lot of times you don't know until you you're in it, you own it in our sense, what the culture really is behind the scenes, because everybody wants to put a nice spit and polish on their business when they're ready to sell it. And then once, once you own it, you see what's really going on behind the scenes. And one of the things that I have learned the hard way that may be helpful for your audience, whether you're selling a business or they're an intermediary or they're buying a business is that businesses take on the personality of their owner for better and for worse, right? Mm-hmm. So if an owner is super disorganized and fly by the seat of their pants, you can bet that's how the company runs. And that might not be a bad thing, depending on who they are, the, the other culture aspects of their business, if their team rives in that environment, that might work for them. But as a buyer, you got to know what you're getting right. for somebody's like very type A, very dialed in, everything's documented, no decision is raft. Their business is going to take on that personality as well. And that's neither good nor bad. It's just, you need to know what you're signing up for. And a lot of what we do at band is try to understand sellers, understand them as people. Not just what are they trying to get out of the transaction, but how did they build their business? What is their origin story? Like you like to say, what were the good and bad parts of growing their business? Why are they trying to sell right now? Because that helps us understand them as people, which then in turn helps us in a non-obvious way. It helps us understand their business. And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner thinking about your exit strategy? Or maybe you've just landed a business through acquisition and the books just aren't the way you need them to be. Let me tell you about Reconciled, your dedicated partner for industry-leading virtual bookkeeping and accounting services. Reconciled pairs you with skilled professionals who empower you to grow your business and prepare for success, whether that's your exit or taking that new acquisition to top performance. Imagine having high-level financial management without expanding your team, from bookkeeping to CFO services services, tax advisory, and even fully outsourced accounting, Reconciled has got you covered. They help you make the best business decisions, keeping your end goal in mind. And the best part? Reconciled understands acquisitions. If they have acquired three accounting firms in the past three years, and their founder, Michael Lee, mentors others in searching for acquisition, raising capital, or trying to aggressively scale. Reconcile invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports 
every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today and let them get your books in order. Reconciled, making bookkeeping a breeze. That's Reconciled.com. Culture is important. Work-life balance is important. I get it. Startups are startups and you got to put in the hours. But that's the real reason I asked it. If I've seen something where, like, pre, like you were talking about, what, is somebody hyper-organized or somebody by the seat of their pants in a software environment, I'd want to see very well-documented code, very well-tested code, yeah. and which is not me by nature. If I write something, I, I always joke around and say I'm a functional programmer. And anybody who looks at that go, oh, you write C? And I was like, no, I write the code until it does exa- it functions to do exactly what I want. And then mm-hmm. I'm done with it. And which means it doesn't work for anybody but me because it, I, it only works for my use case. I'm not a good one. But that said, if you're looking at something to acquire something, there are certain things that have to be in play. How critical is it for you guys that the, like, what's the word I'm like, like for product market fit? And if a, cust- a, com- a company can be profitable and only have two customers. They can be growing and have two customers because the customers are needing needing more and yeah. more, basically. So is there a deeper criteria that, okay, this has to be a broader fix than you call it? What's, there's a risk factor to that, right? Yeah, sure. We've got a long, long list of buying criteria that involve customer concentration, which is sort of our term for what you're describing. How often do customers churn? You could be growing and profitable because you gain more customers each month than you lose. But if you're losing too many customers, eventually you're going to, you're going to plateau. And so that's something we say so you could spend weeks and months looking at a business and trying to comb over everything. I described kind of our biggest filters so that somebody yes. listening might be like, oh, I fit those filters. I'm 5 million and profitable and growing. Maybe I'll give Kevin a call. But yeah, they, like we analyze every aspect of a business because profitable, there's like healthy profitability and there's like unhealthy profitability. So we look at all those things and that's why you go from a couple hundred businesses per month that we see for the first time down to one or two that we're the most interested in. And as a seller of a business, I'm picturing, picturing somebody listening to this thing, like I'm that seat of my pants person and I like making decisions on the fly. And does that mean that my business is less sellable? Well, no, it's just, you got to know what a buyer is going to be looking for. Yeah, you're right. A buyer wants to have things well-documented. You know what's going on. You know that there's a process. The team understands the process so that the revenue and the profits are transferable to somebody else. And I have learned, and I'm talking to myself when I say businesses take on the personality of their founder. One of the things that I'm not great at is like deep, deep details. But guess who is? My partner, James. So if you're the person who's seated their pants and not great, thinking through decisions, you want somebody on your team that is, can counterbalance you and maybe document the things, do the pros and cons, pull together a bunch of ideas before you just make a call. And so I like to think like, we, if somebody's built a great business, kudos to them, however they've built it. Mm-hmm. And nobody that's an entrepreneur that has built a successful business should look in the mirror and say, there's something wrong with me. And I should have done it a different way, or I wish I was different. If you've done it, you're in the top 1% of the business <laughs> world. And so you should pat yourself on the back. Just be aware if you're going to sell that business or when you inevitably sell that business, because that's what happens to almost every business in the world. This is what buyers are going to want to understand. And so the more that you can think through these things in advance, the more you can shore up the things that are maybe less strong about your business, the buyers are going to want to be strong. The that the more successful your outcome will be. And you want to, I believe you want to start doing that years before you think you're going to be ready to sell the business. Because many of these things take years to execute properly. For example, if I realize like I'm a seat of my pants type of person, I want an operator to balance me out. It might be take a long time to find that person. Going to take a long time to train that person. And that person might not work out. And right. so we're talking months, years before I might feel like, okay, I've checked that box that a buyer is going to be looking at and I'm on to the next thing. And there's dozens of things that uh, any seller could be thinking about and working on as they prepare for an exit. And so I just like to encourage people, get started on that stuff early, years before you think you want to sell a business, because all of those things that you might do to make a business more attractive to a buyer also makes your business better and easier to run and more attractive to people that want to come work for you. And the thing that a lot of people like daydream about, that's why they listen to your podcast. 
That's why they call mm-hmm. people like us. But having a great business to sell also means you have a great business to run. And so doing the work to get prepared is useful, even if you're years away from when you think you might want to sell. You know, I'm definitely that seat of the pants type of guy, right? I, I need operators around. I don't like doing the same thing twice. I just usually, I, I joke around and tease people. It's like, if I could get somebody to show up at the right time of the day, I'd outsource brushing my teeth. Like it's something that's repetitive. Well, we know who you are and I like lean into your strengths, right? That's not your strength. That's something else is. And you you hire somebody else to fill that gap. And so that there's a thousand ways that you can run a business. I think we all owe it to ourselves and our business to to look at who we are, Mm -hmm. think about what our strengths are, focus on those and try to find somebody else to fill in the the weaknesses that we all inevitably have. I think great problem solvers are probably two to 3% of the planet. And then great operators are probably still only three to 5% of the planet. And uh, so to match them up, like I'm still looking, right? In this space, anyway, in my real estate mm-hmm. space, I had a great operator. I could go out and solve problems. We did some really complex real estate transactions. We did shorts and negotiated short sales and bottom as investors. Really complicated. That said, I had somebody that was really good and organized who could call the banks every day and negotiate and call banks every day and have teams of people that would project manage all the different negotiations that were going on sometimes mm-hmm. 30, 40, 50 negotiations at a time. I don't know if percentages you said are right or wrong. I don't, I don't have it thought about it. But if, the one, if one to 2% are call it visionary problem solvers and you know, three to five are operators, you also have the challenge of those two people have to get along and gel with one another because you each could be great in their own domain, but if they're not great together, it's not going to work. That's why uh, that's one of thousand reasons why this is hard. Entrepreneurship is hard. Mm-hmm. Leadership is hard. Hiring is hard. And if you can and make it work, you accomplish something game pro. And I can tell you out of all the people I've interviewed and all the people, even before I got into this space, I had a habit of really getting to know business owners and, and how their business worked. I went to all the business networking things and I'm just fascinated by it. I've been an entrepreneur for most of my life. If a business was doing more than $5 million a year, I could almost find the visionary and the entrepreneur in every single one of them. I can't think of a single case where somebody was doing more than $5 million a year in revenue where I couldn't identify inside of the company fairly quickly, who was the visionary, basically who had all the cool ideas and solved problems, and then who was the person that reined them in and kept them on focus and kept the profitable side of things going and kept them from being too distracted. Almost yep. every case. And a lot of times it would be the operator, is what I call them. It could be, you know, there's other titles for it. But the operator is the person who's really organized, keeping the thing on track. It could be anywhere from the office manager it doesn't have really. to be somebody with a fancy title. No, you'd be, you'd yeah. be surprised who it is. Like it could be like a lead engineer of some sort, but he just kind of has his fingers in everything and keeps everybody yeah. on track. And that's just their nature. But they're there. They're almost every yeah. one of them. There's somebody there. And there's, and I think companies, you can buy a company, put a great operator in, and it'll run great for a long time. But I think in order for a company to really grow and thrive, you need both. You need, yeah, you need the visionary and you need the operator. I'm sure I'm telling you something, but your listeners might not have heard of this, but Gino Wickman writes a lot about that. He's a creator of EOS and mm-hmm. the, the book that describes that, he calls him visionary integrator, what you're right. calling visionary operator. Mm-hmm. Rocket Fuel talks a lot about that and that's helped me in my business. And I think any business owner ought to read Traction, which is, I think his seminal book and yeah. then Rocket Fuel about this pairing and figure out which one you are. And yeah, whichever one you are, like try to find the other one to pair with yourself. Because I think the data bears out what you have found just in your conversations that most big successful businesses have that pair. Yeah, I scored on, they have a test that you can do. I scored like 85 to 90 on the visionary side and way low on the, mm-hmm. uh, the other side. But, and I put a lot of people through that test and I am still yet to find my, like a great, most people that are really entrepreneurs score high on the visionary. So I've been having mm-hmm. a, I've been having a rough time. I run business networking groups all the time. And one of the things when I find somebody I kind of click with, I like working with this guy. I say, Hey, could you do this for me? And they don't know why, right? They don't know why I'm having them. Hey, could you do this? Can you do this mm-hmm. in, uh, assessment? I'm <laughs> always looking for somebody that just comes back as a rocket integrator, just like a rock star on that other side. And I've interviewed them. Mm-hmm. The other one I interviewed the team that does the great game of business. I don't know if you've ever read that book. They've acquired 60 or 80 companies by this, but I love that. And they work together really well. The great game of business and EOS are, are can pair up and work together. So that's my mm-hmm. game plan is EOS and ga- great game of business. And eventually even doing a, a ESOP, an employee owned uh, ownership program type of thing. Let's dive into right now. We're kind of at that point where 
we've talked about what you guys are looking for, what you're acquiring, and what's your time scale? Like, are you looking to acquire one in the next 12 months, or are you like, Six months. As we're, as we're recording here in August of 23, we launched in March of this year. So the company's existed since December 1st of 22, launched publicly in March. We have one business that should close by the end of the month. We've got a couple others under letter of intent. And so I mentioned our, our buying criteria is a little bit smaller businesses, but we want to do so with a very high volume. So like we're prepared and ready to scale to the point where we can do 10 to 15 acquisitions per year. It oh, might awesome. take us a little while to get to that scale, but yeah, like it's a, the, the business was built to do one a month, but we don't have to. And so that timetable of like acquisitions, we want to be very high volume, very predictable. We've done this, I said, between me and my partners 50 times. So that can, that creates a good experience for the seller. We know what to mm -hmm. do. We know how to treat them. We know how to take over the business so that they have a, a great experience. And we are able to do it at a very high volume. And then for the, for my holding company itself, the timetable is, there is a one, it's potentially infinite. I'm in my forties. I'm prepared to do this for the next 20 to 30 years. Ooh. Our team's all signed up for something similar. Life happens and there's no guarantee that we'll all be around for that long, but right. we are building this to be an enduring company, just like the guys and girls that run great game of business, that, that business will be around for generations. And that's what I'm aspiring to build big band. I think one thing we did miss is operator, the CEO, you're looking for companies where the CEO wants to stay, go, does it matter? Can you work with both? Yeah, we can work with both. We're set up to, my job is to pair great businesses with great operators, because I find when, especially independent, bootstrapped software entrepreneur, so like we talked about what do we love? One thing that we don't love is venture backed companies because A, they're probably right. not profitable because that's how venture capitalists tend to grow businesses. So they don't find their way to our doorstep, but if they do, it's rarely a fit. So when we're acquiring a mm -hmm. business, it's probably from a bootstrapper, an independent entrepreneur. And when they're ready to sell, I, in my experience, they're just ready to walk away. And that's fine. We've got an army of people that we have on speed dial that we can pair with great businesses. And it becomes sort of a match making thing. Who's the right operator that we know that can take over this particular business in this particular industry. Now, in some cases, the seller might want to stick around because they've got more gas in the tank. They might, might want to give themselves a, a nice payday, but they're willing to keep going and we can work with that too. So really okay. it's a custom model based on what the seller wants to accomplish. And if what they want to accomplish matches with what we want to accomplish, then we'll figure it out. Okay. The other question I have on that is, so there's stay versus go, does it, is it important on like the number of employees that the company has or anything like that? Or there, it's just, it doesn't matter as long as it's built out right. Cause I've, I've seen some of these, yeah. I've seen some of these software tools and stuff and you'd be surprised at how many of these $1 million to $10 million companies are really lean. Like they're done with. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be, but I'm sure your listeners I'd say, would be. I'll give you yes, a You wouldn't be right. Yeah. The, the, the audience would be surprised yeah. that there's $10 million companies out there run on three people. Right. You're, oh yeah. yeah. One of the most famous, I think Instagram, when they got purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars mm -hmm. had 12 employees. Yeah. I now, mean, that's an outlier for a hundred different reasons, but a specific one in my experience, we bought a business that was doing two and a half million a year in revenue and growing on their way to five without a sweat run by a single human being. So he wrote all the code. He answered all the customer support questions. He wrote all the content for his website and it was an amazing business. Mm -hmm. Now, super fragile because if that guy got hit by a bus, the business goes up in smoke, but no, that's the, one of the wonderful things that can scale really big without necessarily needing an army of people. So oh, cool. to answer your question, team it, size is not, is not a, a, an important criteria that we decide to buy a business or not. If the business is built with the right team size, I don't care if it's one person or 50, one is almost never a good idea, but mm -hmm. if it's, if it's, if they've got the ranked team set up to grow the business the way that they want to do, then we're happy to take on teams big and small and wherever they are. We talked about remote work, like I don't. Yeah, I'll care how they built the business. If the business is healthy, we're interested. What about tech stack? Is tech stack important to you guys? It's important that the tech stack be healthy and current, but I don't care what language it's written in, what operating system they're using. 
as long as it's something where it's not so incredibly obscure that you can't find engineers to work on it, where it, that's another one. Like one of the things I love about our business, like that is not important. I don't care if it's good and current and you're, there's not a mountain of technical debt that we have to deal with. Like we're interested. Yeah. I've actually come across a few where I got really interested in the site and figured out it was built on a proprietary home built content management system. And yeah. uh, if you know anything, you know, not the audience, not, but if the audience knew anything about moving a website from one tech stack to another, they understand that you change. And the, this site was getting 90 to a hundred thousand page views per month and decent user base and stuff like that. All that SEO had 3,000, 2,800, 3,000 backlinks across different high quality sites. All that dies if you do that migration wrong. If you don't get those. Yeah, it's super high risk. If you don't get that link tree correctly, it's all high risk. They're moving it now and then we're going to reevaluate because he's, he already had it scheduled to move. We're going to reevaluate it at the end of the move. And the company moved from their proprietary system to WordPress a couple of times already. I don't think they're going to mess it up, but I, I backed off when he said that. Yeah, we'll wait until that move's done and I'll see how the links go. Nothing like buying yeah. something that has 3,000 broken backlinks and all your traffic's gone. <laughs> so, yeah. The, so the reason I asked about tech stack is that there's some prior people, developers I've decided are one of two natures. They either want to be like, they're kind of the nature where they just use common tools and they, you know, they find something that works and they work it, or they think everything else is broken unless they wrote it and they build their own content management systems and their own development mm -hmm. environments. And I have another friend who, uh, he had a software company, I think it's shut down now, but you know, he built everything from himself from the ground up, his, his own like he didn't use MySQL, he didn't use Oracle, he didn't use anything like that. He built his own database structure and his own development environment. And then he built websites on top of it. And he like, he'd have to train yeah. every employee that came in how to use his tools. And I was like, why? Yeah. That's More efficient than not their... knowing that person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I get, there's probably a, a good reason to do it, but yeah. I think the healthier way to build and scale and more importantly sell or as importantly sell a business yeah. is you want it to be transferable to somebody else. And if you're the only human in the world that knows how the code works, that's not transferable. So yeah, using off the shelf tools, open source tools, just like common databases, common code language is absolutely the right thing to do. And so going back to that conversation about what I call annual exit planning mm -hmm. for your friend, if he's thinking, okay, I'm not ready to sell the business, but what if I were in five years? And if a business owner really like starts asking themselves the questions that a buyer is going to ask, mm -hmm. that's probably going to be, be uncovered and okay, or go talk to a few people that buy businesses, not like you're committing yourself to sell, but just have the initial conversation and see what questions they ask. And I bet every one of them would ask about the tech stack and throw up a red flag if it's a custom homegrown tech stack, then your friend could say, okay, if I want to sell this business in five years, what do I need to do today to get myself migrated to something that's a little bit more off the shelf, easier to find developers, common tools that everybody can understand. And therefore his business is more, and he's going to get higher valuation when he's ready to sell it. Yeah. I've run into two or three of these where they're totally built, uh, they built everything in-house. And uh, like, I have a bad taste for it. I just know if you did too. The reason I have a bad taste for it is I come from like when I, my first job out of the military was working for Lockheed Martin. One of our first jobs was to mu move the U-2 spy plane mission planning system from Vax computers to Solaris machines, which if you know anything mm -hmm. about Unix and Linux and stuff that there exists, Solaris is gone now too. So they had to, like, that was when I was there. When I, by, At some point, they had to move it again. Right? Yeah, so sure. it's, I'm sure it's run on some form of BSD or Linux or something now because who, who's out there that runs a Unix-based system, right? Yeah. In uh, my experience, uh, the U.S. government is not great about being on current tools, but we built a, I can't say too much because everything was so classified. We built a firewall system that was so, it was, a lot of it was security through obscurity. It was an operating system that I think we might have been the only person using on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like the OS itself was called Digital MLS Plus. Which is, if you know what, you know what Solaris was? Unix Solaris. I remember the name, but it, yeah, that's yeah. funny. So Unix was a commercial version by Sun of Microsystems that was done. Solaris was their operating system. They had an operating system that set on top of that called Trusted Solaris, which basically allowed the compartmentation of classified or proprietary data. So you could say these packets on the data uh, or these uh, uh, zeros and ones on the hard drive are confidential and more important than these, and it would wrap them and, and encrypt them in different ways. 
So the operating system itself can control that trust Solaris. Digital had one called Dim, Digital Multi-Level Security System Plus, right? And so we built an entire firewall system based off of that. And then turned around and had to port it over to Trusted Solaris because Digital Limo Less Plus went away. They sold that software to a company called Panther or something. And then it went totally away. And then because Compaq Digital did their thing. And, but I'm saying the tech stack matters because if you're on something that very few people use, even if it's you know, sold in commercial like those were, if, the, if, the, if it's proprietary and used only by the companies that sell it and it's not got good stable footing and eventually goes away, then you're... That's a red flag for sure. It's a big red flag. It's a big, it's a huge expense to port that stuff over. And you're also right. spending time and energy and developer time and money to maintain your homegrown software when you could be creating features and yeah. new products for your customers. So that's another reason why I think it's yeah. just good advice to stay away from homegrown stuff whenever possible. These two weren't even homegrown, right? This was like digital compact, right? But I'm just No, saying, I mean your friend that yeah. said he created a custom content management system, things like that. It wasn't even one. I mean, I've run, I can think of four different times I've run into people where they built all their own tools. And I was like, why? Well, it was, if you really dig into it, it turns out it was like their college, like their master's project. Oh, and they yeah. just built a company based on it later on. Mm -hmm. They were showing off to a professor at some point, like what it boils down to most of the time, I think. But they were showing off to a professor at once, say, here's what I can do. And then next thing I know, they've got this whole thing built up of it. But I was taking it a step above saying, there are commercial platforms out there that the companies are not on good standing, good well, yeah, you know, still a technical it, risk, right? even if you paid for yeah. it. Yeah, totally like, agree. Like WordPress is ingrained in everybody. It's got 40% of the internet right now. But I think what's another content management system simulate? Was it Drupal? Like it, mm -hmm. I wouldn't look, if I see a website on something like that, like how long is that going to be around? How stable it is? I start analyzing, do I need to port that over to something that's more WordPress or just MySQL and, and HTML or whatever? <laughs> but I would need to get it off of there because I don't know enough about it. But I, I was just trying to think. It doesn't have to be so proprietary in house. If, right. if it's if the tech stack was either really dated or on something that could go away, that that would be a concern, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want the tech stack to be stable and supportable, and we don't want to be spending money on upgrading database instances. We want to be building features yep. and product for customers. So, other than it's just one of one of the, a number of things that could make a business less desirable to to buy for us. I think we beat this one to the ground a little bit. Let's go one more step forward here. What's your dream business? If you can, on, a, if on your whiteboard, if you drew out exactly what you're looking for, I know they don't always exist, but they're yeah. doing 5 million MRR. They have a customer base of X. I mean, is there a dream like, okay, here's our anchor company. We could really build something off of X, Y, and Z if we found that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the opposite of the red flags that we look for, from technical perspective, it's solid on on common tools that have lots of people know how to build. Top end of our zone doing 10 million a year in annual recurring revenue. And if that business was 30 to 40% margin, so like we can either reinvest and help it grow faster, or we know it's going to just be super profitable. One thing you mentioned, does the owner want to stick around or not? It It becomes really compelling when the owner knows they want to step away, but they've been grooming a number two person. They've been developing their, whether it's the operator or whomever to be that next CEO. That's compelling for us because even though we're great at finding great operators to plug into a business, nobody's better to operate something than the person that's been in that business before. So that's pretty interesting. Low churn, no customer concentration, say no customer counts for more than 2% of the revenue. That becomes pretty compelling. Right. And if it's in a, in a business and in an industry that is easy for us to understand, right? So call it selling to dentist offices or, or doctor's offices. If any one of us has had that experience and we know kind of how that workflow works. It's not a red flag. It's not something we walk away from. But when we do find those niche industries, an example that I'm going to pull out of thin air, this isn't something we're under NDA with, but if it's software for a dog walking service, mm -hmm. like... I have a dog. I don't use a dog walking service. I need to understand that a little bit more. So the dream business is one that's big, growing, profitable, has the team. They could benefit from our expertise and, and ownership. And it's in a, and it's in a universe that we don't have to think hard to understand. Those are some of those like dream businesses. And by the way, that also makes it really attractive to a hundred other people that would like to buy that business. And so that might get 
expensive. But yeah, that's the type of thing that, that I would love to see. It's interesting. When you thought about dog walking, the first place I went would be like cyclical businesses where they, in certain economies, they do really well. And other economies, they might struggle. And the thing that came to my mind would be like oil and gas, like exploration, software tools and stuff like that. Like certain markets, those things yeah. are rocking and there's a lot of exploration done, new drillings done all the time. And the software that's required, there's a lot of software and tools that go into that space and mm -hmm. from all kinds of aspects. Yeah. If I'm in, if I was in the oil and gas, and I would be excited about software that the people doing the exploration mm -hmm. use because the people are always exploring and the extraction is a little bit more boof. An easier one for folks to understand in terms of seasonality. I've got a very good friend who has a business that makes all their money during the holiday season yeah, in America. So like mm -hmm. they lose money for 10 months of the year and then November through December, they make all their money. That is not my style. That terrifies right. me. I want something that's like super steady and boring, predictable month by month. And so that's another one of those things that's uh, on the, the dream business list. I grew up in a painting and remodeling business. I get that. Like when it's cold outside, a lot of people will just paint inside when it's cold outside. Unless the house has power and heat, you can't even paint new builds on the when the temperature drops. And like in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. like temperature drops below. Back then, this was the 80s and 90s when I was young and my dad owned a painting company and I was running it with him. Temperature drop, drops below 50, you shouldn't paint the wall. The paint can't dry into the wall. Fast. It, it just won't yeah. happen until off later. You're out of work. A lot of people like, you'll see pictures of people that would paint a house and like the whole inside wall, the sheet of paint is like drooping down and sagging. And I was like, that's okay. That's probably because either it was 110 in the house and the paint dried before it got into the pores or it was 45 in the house or, and it got 30 at night and it froze before it got into the pores of that paint, hmm. right? The paint, had, they had, it has a cure rate that has to be able to bond and stuff. And so it's very cyclical. There are certain times of year you just couldn't do anything unless you, you know, found the raised condition where somebody had an empty house that was heated, that X, Y, Z, you were pretty much off during certain times of the year. I can get that. I, how do people get a hold of you? We've talked a lot about what you're looking for, what your investment thesis is. What is the best way for people to, to get in contact with you, work with you, and, and build a relationship with you? Yeah, three ways. So first, my platform of choice for communicating about my business and with other business owners is Twitter, which I'm never going to call it what Elon wants to call it now. I'm calling it Twitter. And so my handle is Kevin underscore McArdle, and McArdle only has one C. People could find me on LinkedIn, search Kevin McArdle, Big Band, and easy to find me. And then finally, our website, bigbandsoftware.com. Sign up for our newsletter. We try to put out great content. It comes out first of the month, every month, guaranteed. We share what we know. We share articles and links from other smart people around the internet. We share job opportunities. We'll share acquisition announcements and podcast episodes from our podcast and so on and so forth. I would love any of your listeners that are at all interested in Big Band to find me on one of those three channels. Awesome. I want to thank you for being here today. It was fun. We had a few technical difficulties, but for those that are listening, if you see a few glitches, we're going to edit them all out, but you might see us pop or move or a little thing. It's, we right. did have a few technical glitches there, but it was a blast, man. Uh, thank you for being here today. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I really appreciate him. Glad you had me on. Awesome. We'll call that a show. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and M&A decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace we have partnered with has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now